that is a song that has grown and grown and grown on me. It is a song that has challenged me from cowardice defend us, from lethargy awake, forth on thine errands send us to labor for thy sake. We so often get comfortable with where we are. We get so comfortable that we know Christ as our Savior that we forget that there is a lost and dying world that needs hope, that needs peace, that needs love. And we have the answers. We have the answers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but yet we are complicit in sitting and not sharing. And that is one of those hymns that draws our attention to the fact that we must, as the Church of Christ, start proclaiming the good news, the gospel news. Before we jump into our text today, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, wake us up from our lethargy. Wake us up from our lack of love. Wake us up from our disobedience to your call to proclaim and live out the gospel in what we do. Lord, we have been challenged in words, and Lord, as our text unfolds, I think we will be challenged through your word. Lord, we have a very interesting text here, a text that pushes us into some interesting issues, and I think that we must think like you and ultimately, we must obey you. Lord, I pray today that our hearts would be open to hearing from your word, that our minds would be interested in not just pursuing what we already perceive, but instead the importance of the gospel in the world that we live. Challenge us with these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you noticed in your bulletin, our text today is somewhat of a short one. It's uh, 13 through 17 in Mark chapter 12. And as we get to the end of it, it has a super simple application. But yet I think as we continue to ponder on the text, it forces us to address some of the issues that we see on the news every day for the last two weeks. It forces us to delve into some of those issues and to think about them biblically. And so let's go through the text, and I pray my desire today is to allow this text to lead us to both understanding the text, but also to understanding and responding to the world that we find ourselves in today. Let's go ahead and read Mark chapter 12, verse 13 through 17. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to trap him with his own words. When they came to, then they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and do not court anyone's favor, because you show no partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But he saw through their hypocrisy and said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius, and let me look at it. So they brought one. And he said to them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. And then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Our text starts out, if I can get this thing to work, it might not be working for us. There we go. Our text starts out with an insidious trap. If you remember from Pastor Nathan's sermon last week, the Pharisees, the religious institution, all of them had come and they had questioned Jesus on his authority. Whose authority do you have? And Jesus, being wise, says, well, let me ask you a question, then I'll answer yours. You know, the baptism of John the Baptist. They cop out, and they're like, well, we don't want to answer because then people won't like us. And then Jesus says, well, if you can't give me an answer, I won't give you an answer. And then he proceeds on with the parable of the vineyard, right? Pastor David's laughing because it's like a powerful, in-their-face parable. 
God is the vineyard owner. He has allowed these workers to work in it, that being the religious leaders. He sends his servants to them. They reject his servants. He sends their son, his son, the owner's son, to them, thinking that he will be respected, thinking that they will give to the vineyard owner what is his, and they kill him. And he proclaims that the vineyard owner will not stand for this injustice. So they have been questioning him. They have been trying to trap him. And now they've, they've sort of been put to shame in this one last effort to undermine him. In fact, there's this account. There's another one. And then there's one more final question. And after that, we are told that they don't challenge him anymore. <laughs> they've lost so badly. Okay? But at this point, there is a trap between the Herodians and the Pharisees, and that means nothing to us unless we sort of consider them a little bit. The Herodians were primarily concerned with the political nature. They wanted to basically fall in line with the Romans, restore the reign of Herod the Great, and they were primarily focused on political things. The Pharisees were all concerned about religious things. They hated the Romans. They didn't want anything to do with any of it. They wanted their own autonomous country. But yet they're working together because they have this trap in place. They go to him and they try to butter him up, right? You're a great teacher. You're so wonderful. If you ever have a child, you've experienced that before. Mommy, Daddy, I love you. You're amazing. What do you want? <laughs> right? <laughs> They have this trap. They ask him about paying taxes. Now, it doesn't seem like a big trap. It doesn't seem like an explosive issue, but it was. It was. You see, if Jesus said, well, we shouldn't pay taxes, you know, those filthy Romans, let's not pay taxes, then the Herodians who loved the Roman Empire would have run back to the Romans and said, this guy, this guy, this guy is sowing issues. And the Romans would have killed Jesus. If Jesus said, go ahead and pay taxes, then the Pharisees would have said, this guy approves of Rome. And they would have stirred up the Jewish people to reject him because he's pro-Roman and no one likes the Romans. Ultimately, they're hoping that regardless of how Jesus answers, yes or no, someone's going to try to kill him. <laughs> they are trying to get him killed, depending on how he answers. That's why we are told that both the Herodians and the Pharisees go. They have this uneasy relationship. They are just counting on the fact that he's going to have to answer yes or no, and we'll get him. Oh, we'll get him. Either the Jews will kill him, or the Romans will kill him. It'll be great. But Jesus is too wise for that. <laughs> He's far too wise for that. He has this brilliant answer, right? Verse 15 says, He saw through their hypocrisy. He said to them, Why are you testing me? He's like, Come on, guys. You know, I almost wonder in the back of his head if he, Jesus is going, Y'all have tried this before, and it's always backfired. Do you really want to try it again? Are you really testing me? He calls for a coin. He asks them whose inscription, whose picture on there. They recognize it as Caesar's. And so he responds. He has this brilliant answer. The Pharisees and Herodians, they want Jesus to say either yes or no. But Jesus, in his divine wisdom, responds with a third option. He focuses on biblical truth. Instead of getting completely run in and picking a side on this issue, he runs to God. He has this two-part answer that he declares. The first is to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He says, look at the picture on the coin. In this day when a new emperor would come up, he would make his own coins. Jesus is like, whose money is it to begin with? Well, it's, it's Caesar's money. Well, if he wants some of it back, it's his. You should just give it back to him. Right? Y'all are part of this economic system. You're prospering from it. You're enjoying the Pax Romana, this time of peace that had never been known before. This is his money. Stop complaining about it. Just give him what is already his. 
It's reminiscent of Romans chapter 13. I believe that's in your bulletin as well. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Paul talks about the governing authorities being this institution divinely appointed by God. This institution is supposed to protect those who do right. It is supposed to carry the sword. It says, um, the government does not bear the sword in vain, verse 4. Supposed to punish wrongdoers. And because it's God's institution, ultimately, Paul and Christ calls for us to obey those civil institutions. But Jesus doesn't stop there in his answer. He doesn't just say, okay, y'all, it's Caesar's money, give it back. End of story, right? He goes to something more important, something more powerful. He goes back to God. Look at the second part. Give to God the things that are God's. He says, paying taxes is like this secondary thing. Yeah, God ordained government, and so you need to give him what's theirs. But the biggest issue y'all have is you don't give God the things that you are supposed to give him. It's interesting when you put that statement in light of the parable of the vineyard, right? The master goes to collect what is supposed to be his, and they don't want to pay up. They don't want to respect the son. They don't want to obey the son. They don't want to give glory and honor to the son in the parable. They kill the son. And here Jesus says, you're so worried about taxes, you've missed the biggest issue. And that's your relationship with God. You're so focused on the physical that you have neglected the spiritual. Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, reminds them of the Bible of biblical truth, that what is most important in life is not what you can see and what you can touch, but it's who you serve. And so Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, doesn't fall into the trap of a yes or no answer. The Pharisees want it. The Herodians want it. He doesn't do it. And they're going, oh, face plant, right? Ugh! And everyone is amazed. They're like, oh, yeah. Oh, huh. that makes a lot of sense. Like, God's more important than all this other stuff. So this is a simple text. This is an interesting little text. This text, if we were going to make a real simple application that maybe six months ago we might have made, there's a real simple, as even Pastor Nathan and I were talking about, this a one-to-one relationship. I think he used those words, and I think it's a good description. There's a real simple one-to-one relationship application we could think of from this text, okay? And it's one that no one likes. It's pay your taxes. <laughs> the civil ordinance of God, we're supposed to do it, right? I know, um, personally, when we do our taxes, I don't pay someone to do them. I do them myself. I use a computer program. Um, being a member of the clergy, there's some weird rules involved. But I do my best to study and to understand so that every item that that computer program generates, I understand why it's there. I understand if the number is actually correct or not. I understand that when the program says, hey, you qualify for this credit, I get that the little asterisk next to it that says, um, see special instructions for members of the clergy, I understand that applies to me, and I actually can't claim that credit, <laughs> so I don't. The simplest understanding of this text is to pay your taxes, to obey those civil governments that God has placed over you. Now, we could leave this text here, and it would be appropriate. But this text, in light of all the events over the last two, now almost three weeks, at least in my mind, screams for something more. You see, the description of the government here, in some terms, but especially in Romans 13, portrays a government that is, quite honestly, acting morally unjust all of the time. <laughs> Our civil institutions, do they ever act morally and righteously all of the time? Well, we all agree no. <laughs> And right now, there are hundreds of thousands of people proclaiming that the system is completely broken. So that takes us to a question then, okay, well, hold on. We're supposed to submit to the civil institutions out of God, but what if those civil institutions 
aren't morally pure and they're completely corrupt? That's the question that is being asked right now. It is not the primary attention of this text, but to ignore it in our culture, in our time today, would be to take an issue and to run from it. And so I would like to at least a little bit answer some of these questions now, or at least to point us to thinking like Christ. Let me say a couple of things before I try to answer it, okay? First of all, my desire here is not to be one of those folks who is standing up and preaching politics. My desire is not to stand up here to preach about social justice. My desire is to stand up here to preach God's word and to challenge God's word to change how we view social issues and political issues. To allow God's word to direct us, to kick us in the pants if we need it, to encourage us when we need it, but primarily to think biblically first. If we are Christians, that's the priority that must always be in play. God's word first. Secondly, know that the thoughts I'm trying to share with you are thoughts that I have been wrestling over for now almost three weeks. Um, Even my wife can attest to you that I was up last night wrestling over these issues. In fact, um, two pages of my notes were thrown up into a ball and thrown away last night. And at 1.30, they finally ran off the printer. (laughs) This is a complex issue, and so we must approach it biblically. I don't pretend to know everything. I, I, don't, I don't profess to know everything, but I do want to look at God's word and think biblically. Third, because I want to speak biblically, there will be times that I am going to just summarize things. If we had time to delve into this issue in all its nuances, we would be here till a billion years, Okay. There are ever many of us there are here, multiply that by two, and that's how many opinions we would have. So my goal today is to focus on God's word in scripture. And lastly, in our text today, we saw Jesus. He was pressed with a yes or no question. Pay taxes! Don't pay taxes. They were trying to force him into one of these two camps, right? Right? I think our text not only permits us, but requires us to not run into camp A or into camp B, but instead to run into God's camp, to allow God's word to influence how we think and to allow that to shape how we react. And so I think God's words today requires us to think that way as we approach this issue. So, y'all know me, y'all know I like questions, you already see we have a million questions. We're going to ask some questions along the way as we think through this topic, okay? First of all, let's talk about what is racism. In general terms, Genesis 1 describes the beginning. God made us male and female, very powerful, very important. A concept that was originally thought of in a different way in my mind and now has come to apply in this situation as well. Let me see if I can make that big muddy mess a little clearer to y'all. My son likes to watch birds. There are robins and cardinals and blue jays and woodpeckers and owls and eagles and turkey vultures. (laughs) There are strawberries. There are blueberries. There are bananas. There are potatoes. There's carrots. There's collard greens. There's damselfish, and barracuda, and lionfish, and whale sharks, and killer whales, and dolphins, shrimp, seahorses, (laughs) grasses. Yeah, we can go on and on and on and on and on. Blobfish, oarfish, Um, we could go on and on and on, right? In all of the created order, we see and expect the wisdom and creative brilliance of God to be on display. Why would we not expect that to be on display in how we created the human race? If God has in, used even an ounce of his creative genius in how he has created us, we should expect some of us to have such wonderful-looking heads that God has caused our hair to fall off. 
He should expect some of us to have such disformed shaped heads that we need a lot of hair. Some of that hair might be blonde, some of it might be black, some of it might be red, some of it might be white, some of it might be gray. We should expect it. We should expect some of us to have big noses and small noses and big ears and small ears, tall, short, wider, skinnier. We should expect all of those things. We should also expect that the color of our skin is diverse as well. God created us as one race, the human race, and inside that race we should expect to see the beautiful distinctions and creative power of our God. We should expect to see it. Racism takes the beautiful gift that God has given to us, the outward diversity and beauty that he has made us, and it says, yeah, I don't care what God made. I'm going to use that to make judgment calls. I'm going to use the exterior appearance of a person to determine their worth or their value or how I treat them. Racism takes what God has created and it rejects it as beautiful and it calls it divisive. Racism is evil. Racism is sin. Okay, well, does racism, does this evil sin exist in our world? We might think of John 13, 34. John 13, 34 says, I give you a new commandment to love one another. Ultimately, racism is a complete disobedience of this commandment of God. Do we see that in our world? And the answer is, yeah, we do see it. You see it on June 17, 2015 in Charleston, South Carolina, where a man walked into a church and shot people of God simply because their skin was black. We see it in December 10th, 2019 in New York City, where a man went into a Jewish synagogue in New York City and shot people simply because they were Jews. We do see racism in our world. And again, we must remind that this is not just an American issue. This is a universal issue. One of the things that, um, if you pay any attention, for example, the news of actually what's happening inside of China, they have a big racial problem right now. There are rumors that COVID-19 did not start in China, but was brought to China by African immigrants. And so many people in Africa who own homes renting it to African immigrants are kicking those African immigrants out and they can't find places to rent. This is not just an American issue. This is a worldwide issue that we see. Okay. Well, now we get down to the big one. <laughs> the big question that everyone is screaming and hollering about, or at least asking us to think through, is our country systemically racist? Is it systemically racist in all of our individuals, in our society, or our government? In our text today, Jesus was, filled, was, Jesus was asked to answer to an explosive question. This is our explosive question. And I think Jesus' model should be a model for us. Consider with me Romans 3.23. Sorry, that is the wrong reference. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is my belief that the greatest systemic issue that we as a nation and as mankind face is the systemic issue of sin. Because sin is so powerful and so systemic, it displays its evil, cruel hand in way too many ways, in way too many places. One of the ways we see this systemic reach of sin is in racism. We should recognize that we have a nation who has a past history of racism. You know, unfortunately, y'all in the South, we have slavery. I'm glad I'm from Pennsylvania, a state that was an abolitionist state. We have Jim Crow laws. We have redlining. If you don't know what that is, that was something not abolished too long ago. Redlining, that is a scary thing. That is a tragedy. I praise the Lord, though, for many who have worked tirelessly to revoke these terrible oppressions 
on my fellow Americans. I thank the Lord for many who stood up, preachers who called out other preachers and said, no, we should expect diversity and we should expect all of us to treat each other as worthy of respect. Yet even now, as we have many more excellent laws banning discrimination based on the color of skin, the systemic pull of sin is trying its best to undo it. Because of sin, whether it is racism, a desire for power, human weakness, or many other reasons, sometimes laws meant to punish evil are unjustly placed on the innocent. The power of sin is great, and it's so systemic that it frequently seeks to undo and misapply the laws that are supposed to protect each one of us. We have many great and wonderful police officers in our nation, men and women of all colors and all backgrounds, who work diligently to protect us. Yet even the bravest and the strongest and the boldest are not immune to the systemic pull of sin. And because of sin, whether it is racial bias, just a craving for power, anger that has not been controlled, or simply a lack of love for others, sometimes those sworn to protect us can do harm to us. They can steal the very lives they have promised to secure. We are blessed to live in a nation with so many wonderful people, yet even in our fellow countrymen and women, the systemic pull of sin exists. Those seeking to restore justice and equality, can they themselves commit injustice and equality in the sake of pursuing it? And those seeking to live peacefully and to enjoy the lives they have can be blind to the suffering of sin. Make no difference about it. We have a systemic problem in our nation and in our world. We have a huge problem in our nation and our world, and it's the problem with sin. And sin brings suffering, and sin brings evil, and sin brings pain. We must identify the ultimate cause of everything that we see. There is so much discussion. Where did this come? Where did that come? What is this? Blah, blah, blah. The ultimately, Scripture says, the answer is sin. Sin is what causes us, whether it is racial prejudice, anger, selfishness, or just simply a lack of love, to act differently. And it might not even be to those who look different from us. We can be prejudiced to those who look the same as us because we're just only concerned for ourselves. Sin brings suffering and pain. We have a systemic sin issue in our country, in our world, and in our hearts. So what needs to change? I was listening to a really, really great conversation the other day, and everyone kept saying, things need to change, things need to change, but I was very disappointed that not one single change was discussed. Well, trying to discuss one single issue at this point is like trying to find one pasta noodle in a bowl of spaghetti. This is complex. But if sin is the main issue, then what needs to change is very easy to find. Let me read for you some passages of Scripture. And again, they should be changed from there. Um, Proverbs 31, 8 through 9 says this, Open your mouth on behalf of those unable to speak for the legal rights of all the dying. Open your mouth, judge in righteousness, plead the cause of the poor and the needy. Psalms 82.3 says this, Defend the cause of the poor and the fatherless. Vindicate the oppressed and suffering. Romans 12.15, Romans 12.15 says this, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. James 2.14 through 17 says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can this kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them what their body needs, what good is it? 
so also faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Ephesians 5.11 Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Expose them. And perhaps most importantly, John 6.35. John 6.35. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We have a systemic sin issue in our nation. It is almost futile to try to come up with policies, as I heard the other night someone proclaim, and it's absolutely true. Policies do not keep sin in check. (laughs) We could have a bazillion policies, and we have many great policies and laws in our land, but they are not strong enough to stop the systemic spread of sin. No policy, no police force, no person no society, and no nation can resist by themselves the systemic power of sin. So what needs to change? Well, hopefully now the first thing that needs to change is painfully obvious to you. We need to share Christ. The only one... (laughs) who has power over sin, is God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, one God in three persons, blessed Trinity, only God can triumph over sin. If we try to come up with policies to control it, if we try to come up with things to try to manage it, if we do our best to try to prevent it, we cannot, we will fail. Only God is able to overcome sin. That is why people need the bread of life, the bread that satisfies, the living water that quenches thirst. We need to share the gospel, folks. If we want to change America, if we want to help, if we recognize that there is sin in our nation, then the cure, most simply, is that the people of God need to share the gospel of God. If you do not know Christ as your Savior today, you are a slave to sin. And no matter how hard you try, to be good or just or fair, you will fail. But the good news of the gospel is that Christ has overcome sin. He put the first nail in the coffin when he, was, when he died for our sin. He put the second nail in the coffin when he rose from the dead. And when he returns, he will obliterate sin with just his word. Oh, long for that day. If we want to see a country where people love each other, then we must see a country where people love God and know him through Christ. We need to pray for revival, and we need to proclaim revival. Secondly, we need to love others. The first and second great commandment, right? We need to love each other. We need to make sure that in our heart of hearts that we love the beautiful diversity that God has created that we love our neighbors as ourselves, that we allow love to cover a multitude of sins, that we seek to be peacemakers, that we weep with those who weep. We must, as the body of Christ, demonstrate what genuine love for one another looks like. Right now, the world is searching for an answer. They are searching for an answer, and I dare say, they will not find one because they are approaching the question as a yes or no question instead of going, this is a sin issue. We need to love each other. Thirdly, we need to reject those who divide us. 
Ephesians 5.11, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. We need to recognize that many who are calling for change are oftentimes just trying to stir us up and to divide us. We must reject that. We need to do our due diligence to make sure that anyone that we want to associate ourselves with is focused not on dividing us, but ultimately on proclaiming Christ. Institutions and social movements that focus solely on political measures or gaining of power or a redress, a redress of grievances, any movement that is trying to address this issue by pursuing those issues will fail because the issue is that we have a systemic sin issue, and only God and the gospel can undo that. We need to support those who follow Christ and Christ's wisdom. Those who pursue and think and address the issue biblically, we need to make sure we support them and that we help them. And lastly, we need to hope in Christ. I hate to say it, but God's word says that there's not a utopia that awaits us if we have enough procedures and policies in place. We must hope and call for and plead for the return of Christ. I don't know about you, but the, uh, the millennial reign of Christ sure sounds wonderful right now. Heaven sure sounds wonderful when God's children will gather together in pure love for God and in pure love for each other. We need to hope and wait long for the return of Christ. I want to share one last final thought with you here. So I mean, that was uh, this last slide that we looked at. Nope, that is the right one. Okay, it should say final thoughts. I'm sorry, it says the wrong text on there. There's a verse, two verses in the book of Proverbs that have become especially helpful for me as I seek to think and respond and do and live. These are Proverbs 26, 4 through 5. There are some who claim that these are two contrary verses and that they display the fallible nature of our God but I posit that they display the wisdom of our God. Let me read for you Proverbs 26, verses 4 through 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. The book of Proverbs, and even the example of Christ— teach us that there are some so overwhelmed with hypocrisy and there are some who divide, want to divide us so much that sometimes the best thing we can do is to not get into fights. How many of us have lost the opportunity to share Christ with the real people that we know because of what we have said on social media? Social media wants to put us in group A or group B. It thrives on that. And unfortunately, even as Christians, our sin nature thrives on that too. <laughs> I have yet to hear of someone who has been converted to Christ through a Facebook fight. But I know of many who have become bitter and upset at each other because what was said on Facebook they disagreed with. And instead of actually talking about it with a real person, they allow Facebook to divide them. We need to make sure that what we post and what we discuss, that we are wise like Proverbs calls us to be. The best conversations to have about this are conversations we have in person with people. <laughs> in uh, my hierarchy of conversations, <laughs> how we should rank what conversational forms are best. At the top is face-to-face -face communication. Below that is written letters. Underneath that comes email. Underneath that comes text messaging. And at the very bottom comes social media. It is one of the worst forms of communication. If we want to call people out and point out the real issue, which is sin, if we want to genuinely share the gospel, 
point people to Christ, then I think Proverbs calls us to be wise in how we engage those conversations. The situation we find ourselves in is so politically charged, it is so divisive, that I fear as Christians we will lose our ability to share the gospel by just proclaiming things. There are complex, complex issues at stake. Just like I mentioned, a bowl of spaghetti is, as you try to understand this, this is like a giant bowl of spaghetti. There are some things about it where you're like, yeah, this, this is good and this is true, and oh, yeah, this is good and true, and oh no, and oh, ooh. Jesus was pressed to a yes or no question, and he said, whoa! <laughs> we need to think biblically. We need to respond wisely. At the beginning, I mentioned um, when the Pharisees came and they challenged Jesus, by whose authority? Jesus never gave him an answer because he knew they were hypocrites and it would just make a big mess and he didn't want to deal with it. We need to be wise in how we engage this discussion. I would encourage you, let us take as our Facebook or social media programs opportunities to share the gospel and to encourage one another. And if we genuinely want to change and help encourage each other to challenge in how we think, those are conversations you need to have in person. They are conversations that need to happen in person. What the, now, what the world needs now more than ever is freedom from the systemic power of sin. What we need now more than any other time in our history is to overcome sin. Sin causes racism, division, injustice, anger, apathy, selfish, violence. It causes marriages to fall apart. It causes us to only think about ourselves. The root cause of every evil and every injustice that we see in our society is a sin issue. And if we fail to recognize that it is a spiritual issue first and foremost, then we have already lost the conversation as a church. This is an opportune time to share the gospel because people want to have a conversation with you. It doesn't matter if they know you or they don't know you. They want to talk to you about the issues that are in play. We need to take those conversations, point out that we have a systemic sin issue, and call people to saving faith in Christ Jesus. Only our God has the power to overcome sin. We have the hope of the gospel. We have the hope of peace. We have the hope of righteous justice. Our world is clinging for all of those things, and maybe we can have better policies. Maybe we need more stuff like that, but it doesn't matter how much you do if the systemic issue is sin. Policies and procedures only get used by people who willingly subject themselves to them not by those whose sin is so great that they are just mindless to it. The last words of Jesus in our text today is this. Give to God the things that are God. Jesus was pushed in their day to like the biggest social question that they could think of. <laughs> Do we pay taxes or not? They were trying to get him killed over taxes, okay? This is like Al Capone stuff here. But Jesus said, hold on. The most important issue is how we respond to God. What do we owe God? We owe him the obedient proclamation of the hope of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a systemic sin issue. It rears its ugly head way too often in way too many ways. What we need is the gospel. What we need is the people of God proclaiming the gospel of God. Let us pray.